Let me just start with a brief introduction. This is for people viewing this. Uh, Paul Anthony Smith lives and works in Brooklyn. He creates paintings in picotage. Did I say it correctly? Yes. Picotage on pigment prints that explore his autobiography, ideas of identity and diaspora. Uh, dias um, also, uh, Paul's work references double consciousness, uh, diasporic cultural confusions caused by colonialism. Also, at the, his work is showing at the Kemper Museum, engage concepts of access and vulnerability. Um, the exhibit celebrates 10 years of his technique, a process where he used sharp tools to stipple the surfaces of photographs in specific patterns and in select areas photographed in Jamaica where the artist was born and in New York City where he lives and works. These images demonstrate Smith's longstanding exploration of the concept of hybrid identity. And the picotage process, the picking away at the image and individual at the same time adding to it, explores the layers and meditations on complexities and multifaceted spaces of social and cultural identity in the Caribbean. Uh, Mr. Smith, is there anything that I have not mentioned that you would like specifically for viewers to know? Uh, no, you know, I, I try to let the images speak for themselves. I don't really try to mm -hmm. elaborate on too much. Thank you. Thank you. So when viewers come to see your ex the exhibition of your work at the Kipper Museum, in your own words, what can they expect to see? They can expect to see a range of uh, works that I've been making over the past few years. You know, they're not going to see everything that I've made uh, for each year that has passed in the past 10 years, but it's a it's a multitude of what I've been focusing on. It's showing the beginning of what I've been working on, and currently uh, the majority of the works in the presentation are sort of the last year years ideas of things that I worked on uh, mm -hmm. leading up to the exhibition. Because the thing about uh, making artwork is that, you know, some of those works are not my current feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, what's current is like what's in the studio and the latest thing that has come out of what I've, uh, is I've matured, you know, yeah. I've matured since making those works, you know, like uh, the works from 2013 are not how I, I view those works now. And yeah. the works now are stepping away from the figurative approach because, you know, there's so much figure in today's uh, landscape and we're very conscious of how the figure really works. Uh, and for me, can you still see me? Yes, sir. And for me, it's important to show what I've been working on. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Now, you're also a graduate of the Art Institute, Kansas City Art Institute. Yes. And uh, you are a recipient of a Charter Street Visual Artist Award, right? Yes. What year was that? That was in uh, 2013. Okay. Because I actually, I received it this year, so. Oh, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. How does it feel? Feels good. Um, the art supply store eating it up, but <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's easy. That's a that's an easy one. <laughs> eating it up, but this is so. It's an honor to meet you. I've always found your work engaging, and uh, I've seen your exhibit. I missed the art talk, but I have had access to the YouTube video, so it's amazing. So let's take. We're going to look at some of your artworks. We're going to talk about them, and then. Um, that's it. Um, let's take a look here. Now, this is an example of picotage, and I'm going to show the full image in the next slide. This is a detailed image. Can you, in, in layman's terms, could you explain the process and why you, why you uh, use it? So I use, I study ceramics at the Kansas City Art Institute, and while after school, you know, and during the time that I was in uh, the ceramic department, I really got an interest in uh, painting, photography. I've also worked at all the museums in Kansas City because I wanted to get better at, you know, what I made as an artist. And so 
I began looking at images, images that have been printed, images that we all respond to throughout history. And so I was using a lot of Time Magazine images, scanning them and scratching them. And eventually the scratching became this picking process towards mm -hmm. more prescribed that I'm picking strategically in various places, knowing how to hide, reveal certain I, you know, information uh, because photography is meant to reveal info. And even today, most news reels really when we watch the news, we're watching to see someone reveal. So, you know, it's sort of like a smoke screen. Like everything that is printing or is in a video is not always real, but we use surveillance footage as a way to speak about crimes that has happened. And for me, I'm using the process as photography to capture time. And that's why I say that, you know, what you're seeing in a space is not current because I'm not capturing my current time within the studio and how I'm working to re reveal or disguise certain info. But I began picking a, a, on a lot of my images, images as a way to speak about uh, coming of age. What does that really mean? You know, mm -hmm. I began when I was living in Kansas City. I, I saw a lot of students show up to school, and like the next week, they would have tattoos, piercings, hair colors change, and those are all ways that contemporary people naturally uh either disguise themselves or blend you know ass assimilate to fit into a certain uh stereotypical people and so for me i was looking at a, a way of picking these people to speak about the time that they've uh acknowledged life and what was going on in those moments because like whatever i'm showing in a photo is that that's my experience you know you're not experiencing it and because I'm taking that slide in the camera, there's other slides that you're not seeing from those moments, right? You know, we never really know what happened before after these images are shown. You're just shown like the great moments, you know? Uh, and for me, it's always a celebration of people in their natural state, being themselves, but also they're being vulnerable because they're aware of the camera and for me, I'm taking some of that vulnerability, but also disguising and peeling the layers back by picking away at the photograph. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, psychology that goes into making these. And it's also hard for me to look at them sometimes, even when making them, because like I'm thinking about how to really decorate these individuals. And also when you see the works in person, you're getting a different perspective of who they are because there's this lenticular quality with the images because they become not so 2D, but they're more so sculptural and become like a slight three-dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. And usually when anyone show up to the studio, I let them touch the photograph to get a sense of them because it changes how they see the images. I'm using like a small chisel to really pick into them. Small chisel. You use a hammer or just oh, the, just like a uh, a ceramic tool that I sharpen down with a large diameter to pick away at the surface because the photos are mounted on museum board, which give them some depth. So when I pick into them, I pick up those small little flecks of white layers, but leave mm -hmm. it on the surface. You know. So let me ask you this question: Do you do you have to? Uh, how do you manage to get them in such precision? This has just happened in the past year and a half mm -hmm. uh, before I just pick randomly, but the preciseness comes from having more time of picking, right? You know, there's mm -hmm. no deadline. So I'm really thinking about how reptiles scales are, how a lot mm -hmm. of African masks are, how nature really works, you know, how DNA strands are, you know, formed into mm -hmm. these like molecules, ions, atoms, structures to create right. this larger thing, you know, like, when we look at photos, we don't really think about the small pixels that are strategically placed by each, uh, pixels of color that are strategically placed beside each other. But it's kind of like these little pixels create this larger image. So I'm just thinking about how life is really strategically creating these DNA strands. And if that makes sense, you know, it's like, wood, like wood grain. Wood grain is like, it looks uh, comp complex and it is complex but it's growing from the the center out and so if we cut the wood in a different angles right 
either with the grain or cross grain, we're getting different outcomes. Mm -hmm. okay. So I think, I guess it goes back to like a lot of how, pretty much about how nature really functions. Exactly. It's like when you walk, you don't walk in a small step, large step, small step, side step. You walk mm -hmm. consistently, right? Right. Same right. thing with cars. All the wheels turn at the same pace. Yes, sir. And so there's uh, this continuity that happens. And it's also obsessive. You know, I get obsessive whenever I'm making these things. And okay. you know, I walked into the show at the Kemper and I went, and even though they're finalized, I'm still looking at things that I could like really work on. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying like, what's in the studio is current. Yes. So. Okay. Thank sorry. You. That's a long answer. Yes. yes. You know, I'm an artist too. I know the feeling when you're explaining and articulating your work, it just, it's energizing. Yeah. So this is, this is the full image. Yeah. And it's included in the camper. So do you mind sharing your ideas or thoughts that you were expressing in this image? It, it's just about styling, you know, like how do you present yourself? How do you, you know, Oftentimes you see all these these images and these glamour ads, but they're not real. You know, I've worked on photo shoots right. and I've seen all the people that's behind the image that makes an image, right? There's like the set designers, uh, the prop stylists, the catering company, the lighting and the digital and the photo techs. And here I'm just, it's just me, the camera and these people. And so I'm trying to give you a moment in my life of these, they're small moments, but they're great moments. And that's what I'm saying. There's things that happen leading up to these images that are taken. And so like I'm, and I use film. Yes. And so I forget what these images look like mm -hmm. until I receive them from after they're right. developed. Uh, and I can't really go into like the nuances of right. what right. makes them. It's just that I respond to them a certain way, even the way how a shirt is colored, right? I'm adding those colors in, painting those colors in after the image has been printed, yes. right? Same thing with the grass along the edge of the fence. You know, I'm adding some of that decorative elements and I'm spray painting parts yes. of that uh, wall back in, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, my goal is to try to create a good image mm -hmm. about my experiences. And I'm making these images because I left Jamaica really young, but it's like me going back and seeing them and trying to, seeing the place and trying to understand it and be connected with it. Okay, good. Beyond what, you know, my recollection of time through memory. Is there anything that you would like viewers to take from this work? Uh, I, I want viewers to, you know, just think about being themselves and not always trying to fit into a social norm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We all get one life, and we spend a lot of time trying to think about how to present ourselves. Exactly. Uh, and for me, it's just being, you know, one guy's drinking and smoking, the other guy's bringing his food home. This is probably like taking like two o'clock in the morning during curfew. Okay. The title, Style, could you, I don't know how to pronounce that, Style Pondem? Style Pondem. And is there, is there, uh, can you tell me what it means? So it's like it's it's like showing your style, right? Oh, okay. So it's like style on them, but oh. it's pronounced in Patwa, Jamaica's uh, dialect. Okay. So it's like spelled as the way it's pronounced, style on them. Style uh, them. And it's just gotcha. it's just that in that moment, you know. Right. I got. Right, it. and it's just like that's their style at one, two o'clock in the morning. Right, we're hungry. We are trying to get some food and like. I had the camera, they turn around, I snap their pick, and then you move on to the next day. Okay, very good. Let's take a look here. Now, this is on another piece, and I'll, this is a detailed shot, but this appears to be a layering of different materials. I, it looks, the blue appears to be spray paint, but it appears to be over uh, oil paint, which is over a photograph. Um, could you explain it? Is that do I have it correct? Is that what I'm? Oh, you at? do. You do have it correct. For me, you know, like I moved to the Midwest in uh, 2007 because I wanted to get mm -hmm. to understand America. Mm -hmm. 
And around for a while, I thought about making these works, and it took me a few years to get to them. But you know, the chain link in my work is symbolic to spatial relations, and mm -hmm. how everything in America is in proximity to the next neighborhood or the next item that you could purchase or uh, what your dreams are, right? But sometimes our dreams are boxed in or shadowed or cornered, and so I make these works called "You Dream the." Dreams Deferred, that's based off of Langston Hughes' poem from 19, what, 1955, The Dream Deferred. Yeah, it just talks about the hardships in time. You know, my, I now live in East Harlem, but I started taking these photos in Brooklyn across from a, a basketball court that it was I had this very beautiful bouquet garden mm -hmm. that was next to these men working out doing calisthenics. And I thought very much about basketball dreams, hoop dreams. And now oftentimes we see uh, these players, celebrities, athletes overall in the, their highest point with their dreams deferred based on what happens with them in the spotlight or in the media, you know? And that's how the American landscape is for anyone. It's like one minute you're up, the next minute you're down based on you being again on the camera of something foul that you did and how oftentimes, even the prison system, right? The prison system, like the fence is sort of like thinking about the prison system and mm -hmm. how a lot of people are locked up, uh, black and brown men, women, children detained uh, for things they didn't do, for crimes they didn't commit, but it's misinformation, right? And so even though some of this information is available, it's locked away, you can't get to it. And so we're, incorrectly incarcerating people and also Kansas City redlining, right? Truce yep. uh, is sectioned off uh, with a invisible line. And so you can see the difference. And so I'm, when I use these dreams of third work and the fences in a lot of my work, it's talking about opportunity that it, you're barred from achieving because of your certain social circumstances. And, you know, it's like you could win the lottery, but if you don't have the correct uh, financial backing, you could lose all that money next week because you don't have a support system around you because you were never talked exactly. to or told about what you need to put your, you know, your family, set your family up, put you know, everything in place to protect that surrounding. And it's the same thing with walls. Like we could build walls, but all walls are impervious. Exactly. And we're, we, again, we have a certain set amount of time here. Mm -hmm. And those, that time, you know, we have a lot to do. And how do we enjoy these small moments? Okay, thank you. You know, uh, this is the uh, original, this is the full size image, Dreams Deferred, number 23, um, based on the uh, inspired uh, Dreams Deferred. That's the poem by Legs and Hughes that you mentioned. So, yeah, and so I'm using that name. Mm -hmm. to speak about the social structure mm -hmm. and the complications of the society that we live in. Mm -hmm. Because we okay. hear about it on the news often, far too often. It gets depressing. You try to get up out of it, you know. And even earlier this week, I heard someone on CBS News speaking about, you know, a woman who had her dreams deferred in Chicago. And now she has an opportunity to go back to school again while her kids could get a free education to college, right? So it's always happening. It's mostly in the black community based on the ratios. And I'm, you know, I'm adding layers to let you, you know, the viewer know that they're included in this work. Yes. But also, how do you get to these barriers of deferment, right? You know. When I had my when when I go back to Charlotte Street, when I had when I received that award, I I didn't see it. I used it to pay off my student loans and just kept making work, uh, yeah. because I don't want to keep deferring the payments. Because the more I defer the payments, you know, what am I actually doing? You know, I just get rid of it. I don't want to think about it because that's also another stress on the mind. So many. I was the first to really go to a four year college, and I did that. But also, how do I? Uh, alleviate the stress so I can move on to the next goal, right? Because a lot of us uh, have hardships in our lives, stresses, 
that really don't give us the opportunity to move on to the next thing, right? And even as men, black men, yep. there's a lot of stuff on our mind all the time and like we don't speak about it, you know, and it's important to like open up and get some of that out because it, lead, it can lead to anger. And I've seen it happen frequent. I've seen it turn to mental illnesses. Um, and so I'm painting on the photograph, kind of blurring uh, over that image that's behind it. And then I'm blurring the fence in the foreground to like show you that like, you know, you have all these blurred visions until the veil gets off. You have to get through the next fence to the next fence until you realize that here's the flowers. Now you could pick them. Now you could celebrate who you are. Now you could grow from that. And that's why I'm using a lot of flowers and growth because like oftentimes the one time that you get flowers in your life is at your grave. So the flowers are basically the dream and the fences are those obstacles that cause us to defer the dream. Yeah. To defer. yeah. Okay. You could see the flowers, but you can't pick them, right? Yeah, and it's exactly. about growth. Like we all have to grow and mature at a certain stage in life. And um, got to make it happen. Exactly. Now this is interesting. This is a, uh, another from the Dream Deferred series. Uh, this one does not have a photograph, I believe. There we go. So uh, are there any ideas that you would like the viewer to take away that is common to both Dreams Deferred 22, the entire series, basically? Uh, they're basically the same idea, but it's, for me, it's important to continue making these works because I'm still discovering things, you know? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you stop, like, you know, you're not going to discover anything once, I'm not going to discover much once I stop making them, you know? Uh, and for me, it's important to keep going. How many dreams deferred are there? You know, you can't just make two dreams deferred. You can't make one. There's millions of dreams that are deferred. And exactly. if you stop now, you won't, you know. Part of these works has to get information across. And there's different ways that dreams are being deferred daily. Mm -hmm. sure. And so there's... I have others here in the studio that I'm still working on. You know, there's this mm. one behind me, that one over there, that one. It never, it never ends. I can understand that. Um, even though this is not on the slide, I'm curious how uh, how many hours a day do you approximately spend in your studio? So I mean, I've been here since nine a.m. I'm usually anywhere from 8.30 in the morning to 6 p.m. in the evening. I'll, I'll take a few breaks here and there. Uh, but I'm always in the studio. Mm -hmm. I never not, I always say that I never not have anything to do. I'm always trying to work and flesh things out, you know. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is my job. This is my job. I need to be here. This is where my mind is. When I wake up, I'm like, studio. Well, let me ask you this. You were, were you in New York at the time of like, March and April of 2020. Yes. So did that have any effect on your artistic practice or your studio practice? No, I, I went to the studio almost every day. Mm -hmm. You know, I drive to the studio, there'd be nobody outside. I'll go in the building, I'll make work, I'll go home, go to the grocery store. I really try, I, I, the studio is my life, you know, the studio is my church, the studio is my like holy place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's where I get, my cup get filled every day. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I was in Kansas city last week and I couldn't wait to get back to the studio. Uh, yeah, I know the feeling, you know, so it's <laughs> important to, as an artist, you know, there's no retiring. Nope. It's, it's, it's your livelihood. You know, you know that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have a studio at Studios Inc. And as you can tell, I also work at home. So it's it's continual. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut you off. I was saying when I was a student at the Art Institute, even though I made stuff at the studio, I was making paintings at home. Mm -hmm. Or I would have to be doing other things at home to really fuel uh, the studio, physically in the studio. I understand. 
Well, let me ask you this question. This is a detail from another one. It, uh, it looks like you have multiple photographs layered with picotage. Is that is that correct? Am I um, am I am I looking? At, is that what I'm looking at? Yeah, that's correct. There's about seven or eight images compiled, each frame added on to create this image. I was actually laying on my back when I took this image. I was oh. thinking about like an open space. So this is now an interesting look though, use the picotage here around the center of the image. And um, is there any particular idea that you were working with here? Why it was around around the I'm the, around the edges, but the the and the and and, and you've actually used multiple images uh, juxtaposed next to each other. Yeah, in the Dutch uh, paintings, there's a lot of vanitas, right, of uh, windows, mm -hmm. and what does the window signify? And oftentimes, when we think about tourism, the tourism industry. We don't see black people sitting like this on the beach. And I was just thinking about how much of a joy it was to see people lounging around, playing with their children, uh, conversing on the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was thinking about that in connection to the 16, 1700s of people traveling to the Caribbean. And now in the 19th and 20th century where uh, the Caribbean became a tourism destination for Europeans. Like growing up in Jamaica, I would see a lot of people coming to visit Jamaica from foreign lands, uh, Japanese, Chinese, and so on. And for, it, it's like they're going on a quest, a journey to see a new place. And for me, it's like being in that new place, but looking out from a window of what I'm seeing and just thinking about property ownerships in those places, beachfront property, that most people in these areas don't have the opportunity to own because it's bought up by a lot of uh, uh, foreign investors or white Europeans or Americans and so on. Uh, and just trying to put that in place, but also think about the framing that I'm using is like architectural references that came from Moorish architecture mm -hmm. in North Africa, Spain, and so on that were brought to the Caribbean and thinking of the connection between how much the architecture has really changed the Caribbean landscape. And so going to other Caribbean islands, you see pretty much the same or similar architecture. And now over time, that's slowly shifting. And a lot of what I do is based on make, is based on observation of the people. And this work is large, you know, I made this one during COVID, like I think July, 2020. Yes. During the peak. And so, and I start, this photo was taken February, 2020, actually. So it was made in that time, you know, even also at a time when people are just looking out their windows and not going and going outside because of all that was happening. Very nice, very nice. It, um, any particular ideas you would like for viewers to take from this work? Oh. Uh, I think they just need to relax. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, this is interesting in this one, and I'm a just to peek. I just want to show the detail first. Very a lot of precision and a pattern here. And this is called Paragon, a portrait of Charles Hamilton Houston. Would you please tell us about this work? Charles Hamilton Houston, what I believe is a black lawyer. Um, during the height of the civil rights era. And, you know, he was a paragon of his time fighting for the people, you know. <clears throat> and this was a commission by the Smithsonian Museum. And I chose this image to really focus on him mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that a lot of my other images really disguise information, I use these sort of like striping techniques to really for focus, but forces you to look at him and just think about him. You know, it's kind of like a, he's in the center of the image. I'm using these patterns that are directly placed over him to really focus on him so that you could really think about 
how he was ahead of his time and what he yeah. tried to do for the people. Okay, thank you. For black people. Yes, he did. I, I, so uh, is there any particular reason you chose that particular pattern or? There were patterns that I was working with at the time for other works. You know, oh. and this is what I'm saying. It's kind of like when you're working in a certain technique at a time, mm -hmm. it's hard to revert to the old you. Mm -hmm. And there's works that I want to make from the old me, but like even when I see them, I can't make them. Right. Because it's not me anymore. It's I'm in a different place because I coming from uh -huh. like, this is Russ which is in the Kemper Museum collection mm -hmm. to sort of like speak about I chose the Kuba mass to speak about the hierarchy of this individual but also speaking about you know like the tear marks are sort of like the downfall mm -hmm. of this person you know is again it's about perseverance you yes. know I guess you're like we're not growing if we don't have hard times right Exactly. And we get out on top from those hard times. And so I was showing him in these sort of uh, showing his strength, right? Mm -hmm. Through the tear marks, marks beneath the eyes, but also the, giving him the, this crown with the um, patterns that goes back to a lot of masks that I mm -hmm. have collect. Um, and really try to, you know, disguise his features. Okay, thank you. And this was one of those earlier works too, you know? Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. Now, uh, what about this one? This Where'd, you is, find, uh, where'd you find that? Uh, on the internet, did a uh, search. And I think it might've came on either your website or off the of Jack yeah. Shane Gallery. So this is, <laughs> this has to be from probably my website. Oh, uh, yes. this is a work from 2012. Uh -huh. uh, that's ceramic. I was making these, uh, these, uh, wow, mm -hmm. these ceramic figures. I made this one in Colorado in 2012. That's uh -huh. stoneware finished off with a charcoal. Yeah. Black paint with char graphite, not charcoal, yes. graphite. And you know, it's a worrying figure, but it was just one of those works I was making at the time that really speaks about tarmac workers and just like mm -hmm. another black man working in the Caribbean uh, on the tarmac, thinking about them as these diplomats when the okay. planes, flights arrive. Um, I've never really spoken about this work. work. I think I made it and never really, I never showed it again. Mm -hmm because it was one of those works that were in, in the beginning of uh, earlier stages of what I did. So it's taken, it's basically a, a ceramic bust of, of a tarmac worker in Jamaica. Yes. Very, we're gonna, a couple slides, we're almost done, but there's, I think a next slide over, a slide after that, we're gonna look at one of your paintings from that. Uh, this is a World History's Ancestral Transients. Yes. Would you please elaborate on this one? This one, 2011, 2012. Again, uh -huh. you know, this was speaking about like uh, human cargo. Yes. The beaches, uh, transient coming from Africa to the Caribbean and the Caribbean now becoming this place of tourism, right? Mm -hmm. And the complications of that, but also uh the pollution that goes on within the tourism industry and you know this piece was when i first presented it there was oil inside the drum on top of water which also speaks about again the pollution that oil companies has caused in the caribbean and various places mm -hmm. in these lush tropical blue waters and how damaging that can be to the people and the environment 
but also, you know, and that's why it says fragile, delicate, fragile on the side, but it's more yes. so about, again, a form of care. How do we care for these people after the damage is done? Exactly. And it's oil, so there's also money involved. Yeah. Um, and it's a ceramic bus on top place inside a drum that's painted with auto body paint, which is another toxic fuel, not fuel, but toxic material whenever it's being used, you know? We don't think about it, it's toxic because most people don't smell it. They just drive in this uh, moving ship car. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna look at one more image. I mean, I do appreciate your time. Now, you completed a series of Jamaican tarmac workers. Um, uh, as a painter, I like, I, you know, I'm definitely drawn to these. So please tell me um, what inspired this body of work? Um, it's, it's going back home. It's longing for home. You know, I'm not American. I don't, you know, I see myself as Jamaican. And it's like when you go home, you know, you're told uh -huh. that you're not Jamaican, you're American, right? Right. And it's the, the idea of belonging. You don't really belong in one place or the other, you know, you know, it will be accepted based on what you could offer at the time. Right. Uh -huh. It's like you hear people paying for their citizenship. But for me, it's about finding the discoveries and figuring out what your purpose is and where you belong. And so I was making these paintings at the time as a question of that, I really started making these works after I graduated from the Art Institute mm -hmm. and uh, trying to figure out what to do next. Because you go to school, you're learning, we're learning. And it's, mm -hmm. what do you do after school? What do you, how do you find a job? How do you fit in? How do you move on? Uh, and for me, that's what they were, it's like, I was, teaching myself to paint. You know, I studied ceramics. I knew how to paint before that, but then there's no rules to painting. Right. Yeah, you can make bad paintings. You can make great paintings, but there's no rule to painting or right. rules to painting. You know, humans have evolved to learn how to capture the figure in the most realistic manner. But sometimes those paintings are really boring. And for me, I was creating these black figures uh, captured in time and then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm showing these paintings in America. And oftentimes when we look at these uh, working class jobs, the individuals are black. I wouldn't say menial jobs because all jobs are necessary. The individuals are black or Hispanic. And there's these, you know, again, hierarchy. America's filled with hierarchy. Yep. Like, the trash, the trash collector to me is more just as important as the mayor. I agree. I agree. We, we're all part of the ecosystem. Yes, we're we like are. ants. We're all trying to build a nest. Yep. Like bees collecting honey for the queen or whatever it is, you know, there's, we're all a cog in the wheel. And so I find it important to not look down on these jobs, you know, yep. as a society because everyone has a purpose. Yes. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, one quick question: What does the future hold for Paul Anthony Smith? What's let's what can we look for from you as, as for the rest of 2022? Any upcoming exhibits, lectures? You know, before you call, I had this list of things that I was trying to uh -huh. figure out which works to allocate where, and there's a lot happening. Okay. This is yeah. I just have to get them done. Uh, there's probably like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven shows I need to work on for the next wow. two or three months. You are busy. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to brainstorm right now. But if anyone would like to know, just check back, do a Google search, check Instagram. You know, there's always stuff to do, always. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before we wrap it up, one last thing is um, there's a lot of artists in Kansas City, a lot of um, African-American artists. Um, a lot of them are self-taught. If you had any words of advice, any nuggets of wisdom to share from your experience and your success, uh, what would you say? 
I would say to tell them to get out and don't stop from making their work and showing their work, even though they probably get a lot of no's. Yes. The no for me is fuel for entertainment. Huh? For me, it's important to, the exhibition don't make your work. Some of the best works that are being made are not being shown. Mm -hmm. So uh, keep making, mm -hmm. continue making, continue producing, continue to exhibit the work. Um, mm -hmm. It's all about the work. It's all about the work. No, I also have some more work at the uh, Crossroads Hotel that's up until I believe mid July. Yes, sir. Uh, that's also a different body of presenting works for me, you know. Um, just keep making work. There's a, there, there's, there's no limit, you know. Even if the art supply run out of of material, art supply store run out of material, there's still more works to be made. And I think right. as a black artist in Kansas City, it's important to connect with other black artists. And even if someone won't show your work, you might have to make that exhibition with yourself. Yeah, uh -huh. I agree. Agreed. Even if it's a studio exhibition. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So like you, you said you had Review Studios? Studios Inc. Yes. I have studios studio. Inc. Right. It was Review back in the day. Uh, oh, yeah. You could put together an exhibition in your studio with other Black artists from Kansas City. And mm -hmm. because like, you know, all ideas are embellished and added on to for the next man. And so someone might come and see what you're doing. And you might be, you know, they might say, all right, Harold's doing this, I should do this too. Mm -hmm. So it's beg, borrow, steal. Nothing is permanent. We only are temporarily connect, meet, greet, do some barbecues and share ideas on works, you know? I agree, fully agree. Well, listen, sir, I know you're very, very busy. So I thank you for your time and your patience. Um, and I'm, I'm basically done. So, but thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. So Have a great day. You do the same. The program is brought to you by the Kansas City Business Association.